In his Guide to the Good Life, entitled Aphorisms on the Wisdom of Life, German philosopher Arthur Schopenhauer sets out to write practical advice on how to achieve happiness. This work runs counter to his main philosophy as outlined in the World as Will Interpretation. Because it's written from a different perspective, Schopenhauer makes one assumption which changes everything. This work leaves behind his famous pessimism. Accordingly, in elaborating the scheme of a happy existence, I have had to make a complete surrender of the higher metaphysical and ethical standpoint to which my own theories lead. And everything I shall say here will, to some extent, rest upon a compromise, insofar, that is, as I take the common standpoint of every day and embrace the error which is at bottom of it. We have done an entire video on this work if you're interested. There's a link in the description. In the third chapter of the book, dealing with how an individual positions himself among his peers, Schopenhauer makes an elaborate critique of honor culture. This video series will analyze this critique. Schopenhauer distinguishes between two kinds of honor. The first kind we might call universal honor, which exists in every culture. The other kind Schopenhauer calls knightly honor. Most of his critique will center upon this latter sort of honor which arose in the European Middle Ages and is therefore not universal, but rather very specific to a certain culture and a certain time period. But in order to understand what Schopenhauer's problem with knightly honor is, we must first analyze universal honor. That will be the subject of this video. In part 2 we will go over knightly honor. If you don't want to miss this follow-up, please subscribe to the channel and click the notification bell. Let's start with defining our terms. Schopenhauer gives a very precise definition of honor. Honor is, on its objective side, others people's opinion of what we are worth. On its subjective side, it is the respect we pay to this opinion. Maybe that's not saying much. Let's take a look at where honor comes from. We have an innate realization that as humans, we need others to accomplish our true potential. In other words, we need society in order to function. Without society, Schopenhauer says, man is like Robinson Crusoe on a desert island, not capable of accomplishing much. But to enjoy the benefits of living in society, we must prove ourselves worthy of being a part of it. We must contribute. The best way to contribute to society is to fulfill the needs of the other members to the best of our ability. Humans do this by specializing, for example, by becoming doctors, carpenters, scientists, bricklayers, and so on. Each person plays his part, and in turn, he gets to enjoy the value created by other people who are also playing their part. But a man soon discovers that everything depends upon his being useful, not in his own opinion, but in the opinion of others. And so he tries his best to make that favorable impression upon the world, to which he attaches such a high value. And so, honor is born. It is this which brings a blush to his cheeks at the thought of having suddenly to fall in the estimation of others, even when he knows that he is innocent. Conversely, nothing in life gives a man so much courage as the attainment or renewal of the conviction that other people regard him with favor, because it means that everyone joins in to give him help and protection, which is an infinitely stronger bulwark against the ills of life than anything he can do himself. In this way, honor starts out as a mutually beneficial trait of benefits but it soon becomes something else. We start to focus on the opinion of other people about ourselves. Initially, favorable public opinion was a simple side effect of being useful in society. But over time, this side effect becomes the main goal. It's when this transformation occurs that honor becomes what it is today. Schopenhauer calls this civic honor. Civic honor consists in the assumption that we shall pay unconditional respect to the rights of others and, therefore, never use any unjust or unlawful means of getting what we want. The default assumption in polite society is that everyone is honorable, because we must assume everyone has earned their place in society and we would like others to think the same of us as well. Without this assumption, all of society crumbles. There is no civility, no politeness, no cooperation, without the assumption that other people are honorable. Civic honor is the backbone of civilization. Schopenhauer recognized this. No man can disregard honor, and it is a very serious thing, of which everyone should be careful not to make light. The key word in this story is assumption. The default option is to regard everyone around us as honorable until proven otherwise. And because honor is so important to the well-being and functioning of society, once honor has been broken, it cannot be reinstated. It's a permanent loss. 
And because of this permanence in turn, it's vitally important to protect your own honor. And how do you do this? By being a good, trustworthy, productive member of society. You can see how this sets in motion a virtuous cycle. Because everyone assumes everyone else is good and honorable, people actually behave in a good and honorable way. It's a self-fulfilling prophecy. So far, so good. However, there is a cynical note to be made. Schopenhauer stresses the fact that honor only has an indirect and never an immediate value. In other words, we desire honor not for its own sake, but because of the benefits it confers. This truth has been insisted upon at great length by Alvesius in his chief work De l'Esprit, the conclusion of which is that we love esteem not for its own sake, but solely for the advantages which it brings. And as the means can never be more than the end, that saying of which so much is made, honor is dearer than life itself, is, as I have remarked, a very exaggerated statement. Just how exaggerated the statement is will be the subject of the next video, when Schopenhauer tackles knightly honor, a very specific type of honor which came into existence during the Middle Ages and which has had a steady influence on Western culture up until the present day. But there is another species of honor which differs from this entirely, a species of honor of which the Greeks and Romans had no conception, and up to this day it is perfectly unknown amongst the Chinese, Hindus or Mohammedans. It's a kind of honor which arose only in the Middle Age and is indigenous only to Christian Europe, nay only to an extremely small portion of the population, that is to say, the higher classes of society and those who ape them. It is knightly honor. In the previous part, we saw how Schopenhauer conceived of honor as a social necessity, a system by which every individual member of society is incentivized to behave in a certain way, in a productive way. But because we are granted honor by other people, there exists a danger where we take the honor ideal too far, and focus too much on other people's approval of ourselves to the detriment of our actions. In short, we focus on gaining approval instead of providing value. This danger is present in every honor culture, but it reached an apex in the medieval European context. With so-called knightly honor, Europe embraced a system of honor that spiraled out of control and became autonomous, being completely divorced from the social context in which it arose, where it started to lead its own life. Schopenhauer tries to figure out what went wrong, and starts with a brief history of medieval honor culture. Why was it precisely in Europe and nowhere else that knightly honor took the place of civic honor? But first, we need to define our terms. What is knightly honor exactly, and how does it differ from the civic honor we discussed in part 1? Schopenhauer distinguishes six elements. Expression is the focus. Knightly honor rests not upon other people's opinion of us, but solely in whether or not they express that opinion. Insults take honor away. Honor can be taken away by anyone who utters an insult. A duel can remedy loss of honor. To receive an insult is disgraceful, to give one honorable. Physical force decides everything, and promises mean nothing. These six elements are all interrelated and we'll quickly go over every one of them and their consequences. Regarding the first point, expression is the focus, Schopenhauer remarks that knightly honor is not concerned with the intrinsic value of a person, but only with whether or not people express that opinion. This is related to the second point, that insults take honor away. In the knightly code of honor, every insult is treated as a serious offense, as an assault on the honor of the insulted. It doesn't matter who utters the insult and who receives the insult. Every insult demands satisfaction. A man's whole conduct may be in accordance with the most righteous and noble principles. His spirit may be the purest that ever breathed, his intellect of the very highest order, and yet his honor may disappear the moment that anyone is pleased to insult him, anyone at all. Schopenhauer contrasts the system of honor with the ancient world of the Greeks and Romans, where philosophers and generals frequently ignore or laugh away insults, or even physical threats. Plutarch relates in his life of Themistocles that Eurybiades, who was in command of the fleet, once raised his stick to strike him, whereupon Themistocles, instead of drawing his sword, simply said, strike but hear me. European honor culture takes insults so seriously that often a simple verbal insult will lead to a duel. For Schopenhauer, this is totally absurd. Where the Romans and Greeks would simply ignore insults, European aristocracy, especially in Schopenhauer's day, would feel the need to take up arms and settle the dispute with violence. 
This is because, according to the rules of knightly honor, to receive an insult is disgraceful to the person who was insulted. Schopenhauer gives an example. My opponent has truth, right and reason on his side. Very well. I insult him. Thereupon, right and honor leave him and come to me, and, for the time being, he has lost them, until he gets them back, not by the exercise of right or reason, but by shooting and sticking me. This upside-down state of affairs has its origins, Schopenhauer speculates, in ancient Germanic law. Up until the 15th century, the system of Germanic law stipulated that it was not up to the accuser to prove the guilt of the accused, but rather the accused had to prove his innocence. While the laws have been replaced, the underlying ideas, the honor culture, survive. This is why nightly European honor culture took root in Europe and nowhere else, because it is based on ancient Germanic law. This love for a duel, in Schopenhauer's eyes, is a great barbarity, unworthy of civilization. The Germanic system, where you are guilty until proven innocent, leads to a state of affairs where every conflict devolves into a shouting match of he said, she said. The only way to get out of this is to resort to physical violence. In the Germanic system, this is nothing more than might makes right morality. He who ends up victorious in the duel must have been right. After all, that's why he won the duel. Later, in Christianized Europe, this custom remained, but in another form. Now, a duel was a judgment from God. The two parties would resort to physical violence, and whoever came out on top must have incurred God's favor. In this way, even in a Christianized culture, the might makes right morality remained. But for Schopenhauer, the might makes right phrase is just as absurd and contradictory as the phrase a fool's wit. In other words, a contradiction in terms. Another consequence of the duel is that in the system of knightly honor, there isn't really any punishment for not keeping your word. Where civic honor has a high regard for obligations, promises and relationships, in the knightly honor code, you can just break your word and get away with it so long as you can win the ensuing duel afterwards. Your honor will still be intact so long as you win. You can imagine Schopenhauer didn't have a high opinion of European honor culture, which, we must remember, was still very much part of life in Schopenhauer's time. The unprejudiced reader will see at once that such a strange, savage and ridiculous code of honor as this has no foundation in human nature, nor any warrant in a healthy view of human affairs. To make his point, Schopenhauer reiterates that neither Greeks nor Romans knew anything of this code of honor or of its principles, nor the highly civilized nations of Asia, ancient or modern. To them a blow was but a blow, and any horse or donkey could give a harder one, a blow under which certain circumstances might make a man angry and demand immediate vengeance. But it had nothing to do with honor. No one kept account of blows or insulting words, or of the satisfaction which was demanded or omitted to be demanded. Schopenhauer agrees with the neutral view the ancients had of a blow, and chastises his contemporaries for being so sensitive to them in a delightfully sarcastic passage. But there is something even worse than insult, something so dreadful that I must beg pardon of all honorable people for so much as mentioning it in this code of knightly honor, for I know they will shiver, and their hair will stand on end, at the very thought of it, the sumu malum, the greatest evil on earth. Worse than death and damnation, a man may give another horribile dictu, a slap or a blow. Schopenhauer's overarching problem with knightly honor and the might is right culture behind it is that we let our animal nature get the best of us and we use our fists instead of our heads. This is the definition of brutality and it runs counter to civilization. Schopenhauer regards its development as an accident, a leftover remnant from a less civilized age. He expresses his hope that knightly honor and the might is right philosophy which underpins it will soon be thrown out of European civilization. The theory that might is right, which has come down to us from the most savage days of the Middle Age, has still in this 19th century a good deal of life left in it. More shame to us. It is high time for the principle to be driven out back and baggage. Nowadays, no one is allowed to set dogs or hens to fight each other. At any rate, in England, it is a penal offense. But men are plunged into a deadly strife against their will by the operation of this ridiculous, superstitious and absurd principle, which imposes upon us the obligation, as its narrow-minded supporters and advocates declare, of fighting with one another like gladiators, for any little trifle. Schopenhauer advocates for a return to the ancient ideal of honor, upheld by the Romans and Greeks, where honor is based on a man's actions and not on whatever any given rascal with a loose tongue can insult him with. To this end, he quotes at length from ancient literature, from Plato to Cicero to Xenophon, to make his case. 
His dissertation on honor ends with an appeal to the state to crack down harder on dueling and to end this barbaric practice. At least in this respect, he saw his vision come to fruition. Dueling is not only illegal, but it rarely happens anymore. To be sure, back in Schopenhauer's time, dueling was illegal as well, but it still happened quite a lot, and it was rarely criminally persecuted by the state. In the 21st century, this is different. But are we better for it or not? We have gotten rid of the knightly code of honor in the 21st century, that much is true, but do we have something in its place? Does civic honor still exist to replace knightly honor? Let's get some discussion going in the comments. Together with part 1 on honor culture, this has been quite a long video series. I want to thank our patrons for their support. They make longer videos like these possible. If you want to see more long form videos like these, or if you want to support the channel as well, you can find our Patreon link in the description. Remember, Patreons who pledge $10 per month or more also get access to a monthly Patreon exclusive video. And if you want more Schopenhauer, we have you covered. Check out our videos on Schopenhauer's Guide to the Happy Life or watch our analysis of Schopenhauer's philosophy of religion. And as always, thank you for watching and we'll see you in the next one.